Hi everybody, welcome to 17B, the online version. So uh, glad to have you guys in class. I'm gonna try to make this uh, syllabus video as, I don't know if it's gonna be short and sweet. <laughs> Maybe mid-sized and hopefully a little bit sweet. Uh, I do love this class, I love the topic, it's important for us and uh, hopefully you guys will feel it that way at the end of the semester too and probably through the semester too, the whole way. So um, let's jump right in, so let's take a look. All right, so uh, this is 17B, which is the second half of U.S. history from the 16, I'm sorry, 1865 into the Civil War down to today. And uh, let's start off by a quote by the brilliant... I found this on the web. <laughs> Thank you, Siri. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, <clears throat> that's how you know this is unedited. <laughs> so, all right. Serious side, uh, let's go back to what I started to say. So, uh, from the brilliant Roman politician, thinker, political scientist, fantastic writer, Cicero. And Cicero has a quote there that I love uh, because it's both a witty, but it's also true. And see, to be ignorant of what occurred before you were born is to always remain a child. And that's the bust of Cicero there on the left, and that depiction of his Cicero, that's Cicero right there. Speaking of Roman Senate in this case, are calling out a man who is trying to seize control of Rome and execute the Senate and do a terribly undemocratic violence to the Roman Republic. And Cicero, being the defender of the Republic, uh, is calling him out very successfully. But back to uh, what Cicero says there, ignorant what occurred before you were born is to always remain a child. Um, that's not safe nor wise for anybody to always be a child. Children are great. As you guys know, the downside of being a kid is uh, if you come across uh, adult situations, the kid, of course, doesn't understand what's going on, and a lot of harm can come with that. Thank goodness most of the time there's going to be good adults around, parents and good teachers and so forth. Look out for the kids, but imagine a world where that's not true. Um, Kids are gullible, as you guys know, they tend to believe things told them. Uh, and Cicero is reminding the Roman world and us too in, in our in our world now that uh, that's not a good way to live. It's good to have the wonderment of the kid, but not the lack of experience of a child. And history gives us that perspective. We're less likely to be duped and tricked, less likely to be taken advantage of and give away our power voluntarily because I've seen this movie before. Uh, our, our concern and our ability to process things because we have a whole experience. By the way, not experience just within our own personal life, but the experience of thousands of years, the best of humanity, which we have, can recall a lot. For example, like, thank God we don't have to like wonder, like, I wonder how... Uh, hatred of Jews would turn out. Well, thank God we don't have to try it to find out how that would turn out, right? It'd be a nightmare. And we don't have to wonder like what kind of nightmare they would. We have the Holocaust in our face. Or what would it like to be to give someone absolute power? Again, we don't need to try that. You should not try that at home, right? What would it like to be? Well, again, you don't have to wonder. Our history is full of examples of that. Uh, what happens when a bad man runs a country? What happens when the voice of the people is ignored? What happens? You know, et cetera, et cetera. So you guys know what I'm talking about. So, so Cicero is urging us and urging you, all of us as citizens, to say, uh, be educated, not in the way you have flashcards in your mind of all these dates and so forth. That's not really the point of what Cicero is talking about, right? Cicero is much, much more interested in the big things. How do you live successfully in society? How do you prevent the government or individuals or groups from making your life difficult or worse? How do you prevent that? What's the best in humanity? How do we encourage the best in humanity? What should we be worried about? What are, what are danger signs? And again, be able to take action before they get worse. So, all right, we'll leave Cicero's quote there, but it's wonderful. Some of the names we're talking about, you know, just kind of give you guys a little sense of the, the 20th century and a wide range of Theodore Roosevelt, Dorothea Lange, a brilliant Depression era photographer, um, Cesar Chavez, of course, many, many, many other people of all stripes. That's just a, a little smattering there kind of images what we're getting into. So, all right, 
So let's get down to the nuts and bolts of the class. Uh, your professor, and that would be me, uh, Michael Loren. So nice to meet all of you. I'm glad to have you guys in class. This could be a really good semester. So, All right, and uh, where am I right now? I'm in my office in the IAC Building A, Social Science Room 219. That's this place right here. <laughs> so uh, there's my phone number uh, for my office number, and the best way to probably get a hold of me even better than the phone typically is this one right here. That's my email, right? So. And uh, speaking of right here, student office hours. So student office hours for, for you guys. Now, you guys, you guys are taking an online class, and so perhaps some of you are not local. That's fine. We've got Zoom office hours available too. Now, in person, my office hours this semester are from 2 to 4 p.m. here in the IAC. Now, by the way, I can use Zoom in that time period too. If you email me ahead of time, let me know like, hey, I can't be on campus, but could I Zoom in and have a conversation? In those office hours on Tuesday, and the answer is yes, you can. Just let me know. Um, and then Zoom office hours on Wednesday from 1 to 3. So uh, I encourage you guys to make use of those. You guys are working on the paper, you're chewing on something, something in class came up, or you, for any, any reason, uh, make use of those office hours. It's smart, it's a good way to get another professor, and also do well in the class and make use of those Zoom office hours. Professors like to see the students when you guys come, so either in person or if you need to use a Zoom, that works too. So, okay. By the way, I will update you guys with the Zoom uh, ID. I'll put that into uh, Canvas as well too, so you have the Zoom ID. It's not here right there, but I'll put that in there for you guys. All right, our class info. You guys know we'll start on January 17. That's Tuesday, and we end May 25 with the final exam when you guys click done. That'll be in the semester. You guys need two books for this class. You guys would need, uh, for the record, documentary, documentary, history of, uh, documentary History of America from Reconstruction to Contemporary Times. By the way, make sure you guys get volume two. Occasionally I have students who, uh, by the way, it happened to me too. <laughs> Maybe weren't, didn't really notice and they get volume one. So you guys make sure you get volume two. And then uh, David McCullough's uh, Truman. Now I want to give you guys a little warning about Truman. It's a fabulous book. David McCall, the author, won the Pulitzer Prize for this biography of Harry Truman. The warning, though, has nothing to do with him or the book per se, except that here's the book. The book is very, how would you describe it? It's heavy, voluminous, <laughs> big, long. Before you guys go into cold sweat and think, I need to drop this class, we're only reading parts of this, right? So you get this book in the bookstore, however you get your book, don't freak out. You get this book, you're like, there's no way. Yeah, I know that too. We're not reading the whole book. We're reading parts of the book, so you guys will be good. Dave McCullough is an exceptionally good writer. He just passed away within the last year, tragically. Now, from old age, he lived a long, full life. But uh, he's a wonderful writer, storyteller, and he chooses his topics very carefully. Harry Truman, honestly, is not one of the most important presidents in the United States. We, you, in, in fact, if I ask you guys to write them, they would probably be way on the list. Not because he's a bad president, but just he's not a huge standout. For example, the president right before him, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Roosevelt, or FDR, obviously, is one of the great icons of, of the presidency. It's all true, but as you guys get to know Harry Truman, I think you come to a lot of respect for him, too, and for his journey, what he goes through. Many, many of the changes America itself goes through in the time period you were talking about in this class. That's why they chose this book. Not because of Harry Truman per se, although I do admire him, but, but not really about him in a sense. It's because what he goes through and the changes he goes through mirrors in many ways what's taking place in the nation. He's born in the horse and buggy age, dies in the nuclear age, the age of jet travel. Astronomical changes, technology, um, women getting the vote, civil rights movement, you name it, tremendous change within his lifetime. Uh, it's really a good mirror of what's going on in America, see what's going on in, in his own life, and also in his presidency. It's a good read. You guys really enjoy it. Just don't freak out when you go pick that book up and if you drop it in your backpack or book bag and your book bag hits the floor. <laughs> don't give up. We're just reading parts. So you'll be, you'll be, you'll be good. All right, and by the way, you will need those two books. Sometimes some students, you know, they're doing the mental math to start the semester, and they're like, you know, 
do I really need that book for this class? You know, some professors, honestly, they don't use the book that much. Not only that critical, I don't need the book. That's not this professor. When I assign readings, it's integral to the class. It's not theoretical. It's core to the class. It's core. Let's get really practical. You can't pass the class without it. There we go. <laughs> so if, if the higher Cicero quo of being a, an educated citizen in our democracy, if those higher goals are not enough, I'll make the simpler goal, just the mental math, which is you can't pass a class without engaging both these books. They're both, by the way, excellent. So I think it'll be a pleasure, but it's also you can't get, get to the class success without them. So, all right. So get your two books. All right, so obviously we're using Canvas. You guys already know that. You're here, and we use Zoom for office hours. So I think you guys kind of know that stuff already, obviously, because you're here. So um, that's the way we're going to take care of things. I'll try to keep Canvas fairly simple. Uh, you'll have modules, of course. And the modules are all dated out for you guys. It's all sequential by week. So try to make it nice and simply organized for you guys. Hopefully... It, it should be a well-oiled machine, work really well for you guys, just to si simply follow the dates uh, for each of the units, and it should be ready to go in Canvas. Okay. This class, that's a typo. Okay, we just fixed that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, said, I saw it's 17A uh, 17 there. It's not 17A. Oh, well, actually, no, I, I see what it says. Okay, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. In any case, we're beginning with really the end of the Civil War till today. That's the time period we're dealing with. So, okay, goals of the course. History does not refer merely or in principle to the past. The contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us. Our unconscious is controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. That quote's from the great African-American writer, James Baldwin. There's James Baldwin right there. James Baldwin, what are you saying to us? I love this quote so much, it's in all my syllabi. And Cicero, this is very similar to what Cicero just wrote. Although he maybe explains it in a different wording, but basically saying history in many ways unconsciously controls us. What do you mean by that? Well, wherever you guys are, sitting at your computer, your laptop, or on your phone, however you guys are doing this right now, um, I have some bad news for you, but it's also true for me too. There's not that many original thoughts that occurred right here. Hopefully there's a few once in a while. <laughs> Maybe you have more than I do. Most of what is noodling around up in here and processing up in here has been something that humanity has been chewing on for thousands of years. So... What am I talking about? I'm talking my idea of ethics, morality, politics, economics, arts, the environment, human relations, the family, you name it. Romance, almost any sports, almost any topic you guys can think of. There's a whole heritage of, of value and judgments and choices that get downloaded into this thing from our families, uh, from from our education, which you guys are part of now, of course, from the culture, from entertainment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's not a bad thing. I'm not saying it's bad, but James Baldwin is like, but you want to be a knowledgeable consumer because you're getting just file after file after file of all these things downloaded in your mind. Again, that's maybe a neutral thing. I'm not saying good or bad. It's probably just neutral. But James Baldwin's like, but you want to be, and what being a student of history allows you to do is being able to take out those files put in there and say, okay, so where did this come from? What's its origin? To understand that, that gives you and I greater agency to more freely respond to what's taking place within us, in our culture, to not in a sense be asleep, that we have all this heritage downloaded into us and are essentially intellectually, morally, personally asleep, and we simply move through society almost like in a robotic fashion with no awareness of why we do what we do. By the way, some of the things we do almost robotically are good. Thank goodness for that, right? But maybe there's some dark recesses in our culture, both at large, individually, 
that we don't see because they're completely unexamined. Always that's what James Baldwin's worried about, right? In this case, he'd be talking about race relationships in America, among other things, right? But especially race, right? Say, our society and perceptions of black Americans. He wrote that comment, by the way, in the 50s, maybe early 60s, probably 50s. She said there's so many things downloaded into our culture that without you being consciously aware, you also buy into these thoughts, in this case about race in that time period, in the context of what he wrote that. And they're obviously very dehumanizing perceptions of, of Africans and of black people. And you say, but you don't even realize it. So it's not that necessarily the average person is consciously choosing to be racist in that moment, although they could be. But oftentimes, you're, just, you're immersed in a culture that's normalized. Now, I don't want to leave this just with race, right? James Baldwin probably writing that is focused on race, but his statement holds true on all kinds of things. Race would be one of them, but many things, right? So, in any case, I don't want to get too long in that. We got to get through the rest of the syllabus, but let's move on. But, but that's what you guys do in this class, right? And, and, and as you guys are processing, you come across greater perspective. So you can sit back and say, hmm, interesting. I never thought about that, but knowing, now no, I know the context. I know the context of this. Now my perception of this event is expanded a little bit different. In fact, I think I perceive differently now. Now I understand the background to this. I, may, I think I'll make different choices based on understanding the context of this, this issue. So, all right. I think for time, and I don't want to spend too long on this, but this is a, a more kind of in the weeds version, although it's important talking about in a college history course, we in a more critical fashion examine both the history we study, but also the voices who tell us that history. So we also look at the author. Where's the author coming from? What's the author's agenda? You guys are old enough, you all, you all know that, right? But uh, you know, certain hi historical things are just facts, right? But then there's also an extraordinary amount of interpretation, right? What is significant and judgments. And you guys are already aware of that, right? But just to remain alert and aware to that, that there's judgments being given to me. And not to simply swallow these things whole to realize these are a series of judgments, right? And just and to highlight that. You guys are know that again, you guys know that. But to highlight that, that these are a series of judgments, and so we can be a knowledgeable consumer and demand evidence. Demand evidence to back up those judgments you're giving us. Okay. All right. There's, of course, learning outcomes. Um, and uh, those are kind of helpful for on my side for assessment. You guys don't need to worry so much about that. All right. Now, what you guys want to know and we're getting to right now, let's get down to brass tacks here, right? So, what do we need to do for class? That's what you, get. <laughs> you guys have been waiting for this whole video. Okay. So, what do we have to do? Here we go. So, what do you guys need to do for class? The first one is participation, and the way you guys do that, because participation obviously is an online class, um, you guys are going to create questions based on the readings. Now, I'm just going to briefly describe this. I'll make a separate short video. I go into more detail. I'll tell you exactly how to do this with more detailed instructions. By the way, it's not hard. Actually, it's quite simple and easy to do. But again, I'll, I'll just briefly describe it, and then you'll have a separate video where I'll go into a bit, just a bit more detail. So you guys really will have this really strong and easy understanding what I'm asking for here. But essentially, on the typical class, and I give you an example here, you might have, in this case, page 50, 65 in Truman to read, right here. So you read those pages. And then you have two, quite short, you can see the pages there, two short reads here in your other textbook. So what you do for this part of the, uh, of the class is you need to create two questions for each of those readings. So based on those 15 pages in Truman, as you read, you'll come across something that you don't understand or you wouldn't want to know more of. So you simply write down, like, why did Truman do this? I don't understand, like, why he would have done this. Now, the good news is you don't need to know the answer. It's a legitimate question you have just as you're processing, as you're reading. See what I'm saying? So you're not answering this. So this is not like a quiz question, like, what color is Truman's hair? That, that's not what it is. It's a question you generally have as you read that chapter. You're like, okay, Truman does this, but McCullough, the author, does not explain why he did this. I don't understand like why he would, that doesn't make sense to me. Perfect, done. 
write down that question. You'll do two questions for those for that reading there in Truman, and then you do questions for this case, in my sample, be so generous truth address the first annual meeting of the American Human Rights Association. You write two questions to that piece, and then finally you write two questions to Chief Joseph in his perspective. This is not hard, just I want you to ask, ask you guys to be thoughtful. You'll save those questions in a running Word document. At the midterm, you'll turn in all those questions for all those readings that have been signed for the whole first half of the semester. It'll be quite a few by then, right? And, at the, and then the second half of the semester, the, on the final, you'll turn in your questions for the whole second half of the semester. I won't go much beyond that uh, because, again, I'm going to make a separate short video where I'll actually show you guys exactly what I'm talking about. I'll give you guys a sample and go over a little more detail, right? So that's just enough right now, but I just wanted to let you know it's a big part of your grade. It's quite easy to do. Just create, takes a little bit of thought. Be very good for you guys' grade. But it's how you respond to your daily readings from both here we go, from both your books. Okay. All right. You have discussions in Canvas. You guys are probably familiar with those. If you're not, they're pretty self-explanatory, and you'll see that instructions in modules how to do those. Uh, I will assign some documentaries for you guys to watch. Not a lot, but a few. Uh, they're good. And you guys will respond to that. And in modules, it'll explain exactly how to do those uh, responses to those videos. There'll be links there all ready to go. Just as you'll see that, and you go through modules, you'll see those video assignments. And when you open up that page, it'll tell you how to do it. There'll be a nice link in there to the video. And that you'll upload it there, so it'll be all ready to go for you. All right. At the end of the semester, you guys are in a critical analysis paper based on Truman, which you've been reading, and for your other textbook, for the record, be based on this too. Um, and I'll go over more details of that because I'll have a specific video and an explanation how to do that. All that will be in modules in the last unit, unit four, and you'll see the critical analysis paper. You'll click on that, and there'll be a sample paper in there. There's a nice video description how to do it, the prompts there, everything you guys need will be there explaining how to do that. You guys don't need to worry about that right now. I'll just say it's at the end of the semester. That's kind of our summation project for the class, is that one. So you kind of pool your experiences in Truman, your experiences in For the Record as you're describing that, and you'll do that in that paper. Uh, it's worth quite a few points, but you guys be ready to do that by the end of the semester. You guys will be good. And finally, last but not least, here, let me get a drink. All right, I'm back. There are four exams for the class. And the exams are based 100% on the recorded lectures in Canvas. As you guys are doing your weekly modules, or the start of your weekly modules, you read for that week. Remember, you'll use those for your questions on these two books, right? So you're, you'll read those and create your questions. Uh, and then below that, you'll see the lectures for that for the for the week too. You see the lectures there. So watch those le lectures. Take good notes. And then that'll come in handy on the four exams. The four exams are based entirely on the lectures you guys see there in the modules on Canvas. So take good notes. And the good news is, you guys, the exams are open note. I don't know how, because it's, it's an online exam, I don't, I don't know how I can make it not open note. <laughs> so open notes, fine. So take good notes. You can have your, so when you take the exam, you can have all your notes all stacked up, ready to go. Now, by the way, you still need to study. Don't, so don't get, some of you like, okay, so that means I could just take notes and not have to review anything and I'm good to go. No, because you won't have enough time, right? So still review your notes, study, obviously. But on the exam, it would be handy. You could have your notes stacked up and you're taking the exam. But occasionally you get in the jam, like, I don't remember that one. Okay, but you could go to your notes and it should be right there. So you guys should do well on the exam as long as you take good notes. Also make it a little bit easier for you guys in the notes, I will highlight things in the notes as you go. See, we'll see in the in the lecture videos. I'll highlight things. A little tip right here: write down the highlighted stuff. Sometimes in the notes you feel overwhelmed because I'll have extra content in there. Typically, if it's not written, if I'm sorry, if it's not highlighted, you don't need to write it down. Now you can, but the highlights of that's what you really want to write down. So whenever you see something highlighted in the notes. Bingo, pause the video, pause the lecture, write that down, then you can push play again. Okay. Now, before those exams, they're tr multiple choice, true and false. And that's how the class breaks down. You guys see that question response to readings is worth 22%. That's those questions you guys will make based on the readings. And again, there'll be an explanation video on the homepage how to do more of that. 
and samples. Uh, discussions in Canvas, yep. And the video documentaries you guys will do, that final paper due at the end of the semester, and then your four exams, and they're spaced out equally through the semester. And that's the whole class. So it's worth 660 points. As I grade, you guys will see your score pop up there in Canvas, of course, so you guys can monitor how you're doing. So uh, I think we'll make a good progress. Let's get to uh, the last kind of little, clean the last part of the class here. So late work, um, you could lose points naturally. Uh, the exception to that would be obviously uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, medical issues and so forth. Just contact me, let me know. We all have issues that includes in my family, things go on. Just let me know what's going on and uh, I'll work with you. Um, but the be best policy obviously is don't be late. But if something comes up, email me, let me know what's going on, or I'll work it out. Uh, if you're not involved in Canvas, I may drop you. So if you, uh, like for example, the first three weeks of the semester and you're just like a no-show, you're probably gonna get dropped. So you'd be feeling anyways, but you're probably gonna be dropped too. Uh, but, but honestly, Usually, if it comes down to it, I tend, if I'm not sure, I tend not to drop because I don't want to drop you guys out. Maybe some emergency came up and you were disengaged for a week or so, but you're a good student and you jumped right back in after you, you handled that crisis. So I don't want to like prematurely eject you from the class. I, I never want to do that. So I tend to err on the side of not dropping. So the reason I bring that up for you guys is there are some students that happens every semester who, for one reason or another, they they don't like my office background or you know, you know or the ties I wear in my lectures or whatever. You know, for some reason, uh, they got exit the class. And that's fine. I, I get it. I when I was a college student like you guys, I had to drop out a couple classes too. <laughs> so I guess that's life, right? But just protect your GPA. Do the simple paperwork you can do online and drop the class. Don't stay in the class, but not attend and just kind of hope that somehow it'll work itself out. Because that means an F. And you guys don't get that on your GPA. It's bad for your financial aid. It's just it's bad all the way around. Protect yourself, protect your GPA, drop the class if if you have to. All right, at academic dishonesty. Now, this is an online class. And I'm sure 99% of you guys are on it, and you would never, ever even entertain the idea of plagiarizing or cheating. So I'm just talking to that 1%. Now, the rest of you guys are all good. You guys are morally opposed. You're like, not going to do that. No, it's bad for education. It's not going to end well. It's also risky for your GPA. You get caught, et cetera, et cetera. I'm talking to that 1% who has a slight temptation, just a little temptation. Like maybe I can cut and paste some stuff, I can borrow some papers, etc. The consequences are bad. So even if, let's put aside the morality for a minute. So even if there's no little angel on your shoulder, competing with a little devil on their shoulder, the little devil with the pitchfork's like, do it, do it. <laughs> the little angel's like, that's a bad idea, it'd be wrong to do that, don't do that. Even though that, that little angel's there not telling you it's morally wrong, Let's get really practical. If you get caught doing it, the consequences are pretty catastrophic for your grade. So what I always tell students, like, look, worst case scenario, maybe you turn an assignment that's not so good. You did your best, but you're busy, work, whatever, and the assignment's not so good. That assignment is still worth points. When you plagiarize, it's worth zero points. Catastrophic. Happens one time, it's really bad. Happens on your final paper, probably fail the class. That's that big a deal. So, translation, do the mental math. If, if the little angel talking to you doesn't do it, be really practical. <laughs> really practical, which is the consequences of me trying to get some points or cheating, it's not worth it because I get caught doing it. And I got a pretty good, I've been around for a while. We got pretty good software too. Uh, it's not going to end well. All right, that's enough of that. Extra credit. There's all kinds of wonderful things you guys do. Extra credit. I highly recommend these. All kinds of fabulous museums, both locally and in the Bay Area, and places you guys can visit. Uh, I think I might make a video, extra credit video, just on this issue because all kind of again, wonderful things you guys can do. Extra credit. Museums, all kinds of good stuff. So, highly encourage you guys to do that. Um, 
it's both a whole, be fun, by the way, but also good for your grade too. It's, it's a win-win because extra credit, most of these things, I think you guys would really enjoy it. Um, and even better, besides enjoying it, being a fun thing for you to do, you get points great for your grade. We're almost done here. Most of these actually are for people who are on, excuse me, on campus, which you guys, at least for this class, are not. So it may not really apply to you. If you are on campus, obviously not for my class, but for other classes, the Campus Shield app that Mercer College has is a really wonderful safety thing. It's a wonderful app that you have on your phone. If you're on campus, it's the quickest way to summon campus police. Medical emergency, God forbid, but some other kind of emergency, great way to get a hold of them. Obviously, you can always call 911, of course. And if you're not on campus, Campus Shield is not going to help you. That's just if you're on campus. But if you're on campus, the first responders are our Merced Campus Police. Now, I've actually used this. I have this app on my phone. I've used it. So I had a student who, a number of years ago had a seizure in my class. Scary. We called the campus police. They were within minutes. Unfortunately, everything turned out okay. It was serious. The ambulance came and the, the individual was taken to the hospital. Fortunately, they, they ended up being okay, but it, it was scary, you know, and uh, it's nice to have quick responders arrive very quickly to get the student rapid assistance. So in any case, but that's if you're on campus. Cell phone policy, well, you guys are an online class, so I think we're good. <laughs> that's not an issue. That's, that's for in-person classes. Don't worry about that. These last two are important, though, which is uh, be respectful of fellow students. They yeah, come into play in our discussion pages. So you may not disagree, you may not agree with someone. That's fine, but we treat them with full humanity and respect. I might not like your position, but I respect you as an individual, and I respond even if I disagree with you with respect for who you are and for your right to expand your views, even though I may strongly disagree. That's all fine. We do that in a polite setting, in a professional setting. Finally, we're at the end here. Uh, American Disabilities Act. There's all kinds of wonderful resources here on campus. So please make use of those. Um, let's keep our class safe. Uh, I think our class should be safe. But if you see something that you make you uncomfortable, something discussion board, something that comes up that you think is inappropriate, please let me know. Let's keep things safe. We'll make sure this is a safe environment for all of us. It's the best learning environment. So uh, let's keep that, keep it a very safe environment. Finally, last things, and I don't think I'll really go over these. You guys can do this in the syllabus. Uh, the link is uh, the, the link is also on the homepage where this video is. So if you guys want to look at things, for example, tutoring stuff, how to recommend it. Uh, other resources, definitely make use of those. Uh, click on the link, uh, and you can take a look at those at, at your leisure um, at, if it would be useful to you guys. And uh, I think that's it. So uh, welcome to class, everybody. It's going to be a really good semester. Um, you have just completed probably the worst lecture of the whole semester. I mean, worst. I, uh, well, I mean, what I mean by that is that there's not a lot of, uh, this is all like looking at the menu, right? So I'd use the analogy, you know, if you're at a restaurant, you just sat down and looked at the menu. That's what the syllabus is going to be, just the menu. You looked at all these menu items. Looks nice, but you want to taste. The taste starts where we do next week, right? So you actually get into the readings, we get into the lectures, we get into the wonderful and important topic of American history, what it means for you and I as a citizen in our great democracy to make this a more perfect union. And you and I can all play an important role in that. So with that, I'll wrap it up right here. So welcome to class, everybody. It's wonderful to have you in class. And until next time, take care.